Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I'm a social psychologist, so I focus on more of the experimental side of things. So I'll be sharing some work that I've been doing with my colleagues on our bias in moral concern for men and women suffering. So <laughs> if you read the news or follow social, social media, I'm sure you have been inundated with stories uh, lamenting the over-representation of men at the top tail of the social distribution. So indeed, men are more likely to be full professors, CEOs, and world leaders. However, you have probably encountered many fewer stories lamenting the over-representation of men at the bottom of the social distribution. So men are more likely to be incarcerated, homeless, die of drug addiction, drop out of high school, so it seems that our concern, as the talks today have suggested, our concerns about gendered social outcomes manifest quite asymmetrically. So why is this the case? My research today is aiming to understand why from a cognitive perspective we might see this pattern. So in the realm of moral psychology, Kurt Gray has argued that when we evaluate a moral action, we basically apply this cognitive schema, and he refers to it as a dyadic template. So essentially, when we view a moral action, we naturally typecast the involved individuals into the, the role of intentional agent or perpetrator or suffering patient or victim. And so these evoke quite different moral responses, as you, you would imagine. So perpetrators are perceived as responsible, they're agentic, they deserve blame and punishment. And then patients are perceived as experiencing pain, and they evoke sympathy and aid. Now, Gray has argued that these categories are relatively mutually exclusive, such that as we begin to see a target as more of an agent or perpetrator, it makes it harder for us to see them also as a patient or victim and vice versa. So in this talk, I'm going to argue that gender is a variable that shapes our application of this moral dyadic template. So for a variety of reasons, you might uh, find that men are more strongly associated with the agentic roles or perpetrator in the context of harm. So if you consider the history of human warfare, men have primarily comprised the troops on the battlefield. So this historical involvement in aggressive conflict might make it easier for us to see men as aggressive. And men's morphology might also contribute to these perceptions. So compared to women, men have more upper body musculature. And people have linked musculature to lower uh, perceptions of pity. So we just see those, those individuals as more capable and agentic. But also behavioral data would support uh, typecasting men as agents. So outside perhaps of intimate partner relationships, as we're learning, um, men are more physically aggressive, so they commit the preponderance of homicides. So based on these patterns, you could easily generate the prediction, men will be more easily typecast in the agentic role or perpetrator. Now, for a variety of reasons, we also argue women should be more likely to be typecast as the patients or the victims. So consider the following evolutionary logic. So like other mammals, female inter uh, internal gestation and pregnancy occurs in the female body. So with nine months of investment in every pregnancy, women set the upper limit on reproduction. So all else equal, a group of many women and few men could out-reproduce a group comprised of few women but many men. So you'd imagine from this perspective, if there are reproductive outcomes to keeping women alive, then people might be more inclined to see women as vulnerable and deserving protection from harm. There are also physiological reasons why you might see women fitting more in the victim role. So in both lab experiments and from diagnoses, women have a lower pain threshold relative to men. And these are all, I should note, average differences. So of course there's a ton of overlap, um, but these average differences would be congruent with placing women in the victim or patient role. So we predicted women will be more easily typecast as patients 
and they sh congruent with the patient role or victim role, they should be perceived to experience greater pain. And women's suffering should evoke stronger distress and motivation to alleviate compared to men's suffering. Men, on the other hand, should be more easily typecast as agents or perpetrators, and so they should therefore be perceived as more blameworthy and evoke stronger punitive responses. So, are women more easily typecast as victims? In study one, we looked at this by recruiting 300 American MTurkers, and they were randomly assigned to view one of three scenarios depicting workplace harm. So, for example, this might be a surgeon bullying their surgical trainee to the point where the trainee develops depression and anxiety about going into work. So, we manipulated the gender of the perpetrator, but left the gender of the suffering target as ambiguous. We also manipulated how we labeled the targets. So, we either labeled them as victim and perpetrator, seeing if by chance, when you activate this cognitive template of moral harm, do you see a different pattern compared to if you use more neutral terminology like party A and party B? So we asked participants, to the best of your recollection, what was the gender of the harmed individual? Now, you'll remember we never specified in the scenario, so we wanted to look at what are their intuitions. We also asked them how much did the harm target uh, deserve this suffering using a five item measure. How much warmth do you feel towards the harm target using a 10 item measure? And perceptions of the harm target's moral character using a nine item measure. Okay, so what did we find? So participants more often assumed a female victim, so 76% of the time that was their assumption. But they were especially likely to assume a female victim when we labeled the targets as perpetrator and victim, suggesting there's this cognitive link when you activate this moral template people are especially likely to place women in the victim role. What about their perceptions of the harm target? So this is based off participants' assumption of the harm target. So in pink, that was if they assumed a female harm target, and blue if they assumed a male. So you'll notice that they felt less warmly towards the harmed male target than the harmed female target. They also perceived the harmed male as less moral, and they felt that the harmed male deserved the suffering more than the harmed female. So from study one, we learned that people more easily assume harm target is female, but especially when you activate this victim framework, and people respond less compassionately to male victims, as I'm sure you all know. However, there are limitations to the study from a methodological perspective. It could be the case that we had activated other gender stereotypes that participants were responding to, so they might assume, for example, oh, well, if women are more likely to be in a subordinate role in the workplace, they might be the surgical trainee, or if women are more often diagnosed with depression, that might be why they would assume a female victim. And we haven't yet looked at perpetration. So in study two, we wanted to see, look at both sides of this pattern. Do people typecast victims as female and perpetrators as male? And we tried to extract all of the human components as possible to see whether the pattern would still persist. So we recruited a cross-cultural sample of Chinese managers and Norwegian university students. Each participant viewed three brief videos. So you can see over here, it's a video of triangles interacting. Um, and we told them that this video represents the interaction of a male and female coworker. So in one video, there was no perpetration. So the green triangle just kind of looks at the orange triangle. Uh, in the single perpetration video, the green triangle seems to poke the orange triangle, and the orange triangle doesn't do anything. And then in the retaliation, the green triangle pokes the orange triangle, um, and the orange triangle uh, retaliates twice back. And we made sure to specify that this wasn't physical harm to eliminate, to attempt to eliminate um, those uh, gender stereotypes as well. So we asked participants um, their perception of each triangle's 
victimizations. To, so to what extent is the green triangle the victim? What extent is the orange triangle the victim? And then likewise for perpetration. So to what extent is the green triangle the perpetrator and the orange triangle the perpetrator? And then for our dependent measure, we ask them, what do you think is the sex of the triangles? So they could either choose green as male, orange as female, or the reverse, orange as male, green as female. And we made the prediction that as you perceive a triangle as more of a perpetrator, that would increase your likelihood of classifying that triangle as male. And as you increasingly view a triangle as a victim, that would increase your likelihood of typecasting that triangle as female. So because these data were nested, we used hierarchical linear modeling to analyze them. So level one just accounted for the fact that everyone saw three of the videos. Level two accounted for the participant level characteristics, like whether they were male or female. Um, and then level three looked at the sample, or accounted for the fact that these were nested within samples, so whether they were Chinese managers or Norwegian students. What we found across all three videos and our samples was that indeed, as you perceive a triangle as more of a victim, that increases classification as female. Likewise, as you perceive a triangle as more of a perpetrator, that predicts classification as male. And so we didn't find a difference across our two study samples, even though they were collected from um, quite different cultural contexts. So what do we learn from study two? This further supports the biased application of moral typecasting. Um, looking at both sides of the pattern, suggesting perpetration is cognitively linked with men, victimization cognitively linked with women. And because we you know, extracted the human components to suggest that you know, it wasn't driven by these um, extraneous gender, gender base rates, people were attributing these identities to animated shapes. Um, and because we found no difference between our two cultural samples, this suggests this might be a universal pattern of human cognition. However, we haven't yet experimentally manipulated victim and perpetrator sex. Thus far, we've only focused on your assumptions of victim and perpetrator sex. So study three, we aim to get at that with 214 Americans. And so we had them read a scenario where uh, a colleague um, makes an ambiguously uh, offensive comment. So these are two colleagues there in line at their workplace cafeteria. Colleague A drops their fork and bends over to pick it up. And colleague B says, you must get a lot of practice doing that. So ambiguous but offensive no matter who you're saying it to. <laughs> Probably inappropriate for the workplace. <laughs> Okay, so we manipulated this time both the perpetrator gender and the victim gender to get um, an assessment of how people respond. We asked them, how much pain do you think the victim experienced upon hearing this comment? How much pain do you think the perpetrator would experience if they were accused of harassment? How much do you desire to punish the perpetrator? So for example, should they be fired? There's, this was a composite of five items. And how motivated are you to forgive the perpetrator of this comment? So congruent with the patient role, female victims were expected to experience more pain upon hearing this comment. Interestingly, female perpetrators were also expected to experience more pain upon being accused of harassment. So even in the perpetrator role, we're still assigning women these qualities of victim. People felt more willing to punish the male perpetrator than the female perpetrator for making the same exact comment. They were less willing to forgive a male perpetrator. And they desired harsher punishments for those who targeted women. So this was an effect of the victim on responses to the perpetrator. So study three taught us this extends, um, this bias extends to perpetration of harm. Not only do people assume female victims suffer greater pain, they also assume female perpetrators do as well. And people experience stronger motivations to punish male perpetrators. So last in study four, we wanted to see, does this extend to group level discrepancies? So we've only looked at individual type scenarios so far. So we had a sample of Canadians. They evaluated a scenario where a managerial team had to lay off nine employees because their jobs were redundant. 
So we manipulated the sex of the fired employees such that they were all women or all men. And we asked how much pain did the laid off men or women experience upon being fired? How much harm did the managerial team inflict on the men or women they laid off? How fair was this decision? And perceptions of the managerial team's morality. How much do you think that they are moral? So I'm sure you guys can guess what we found. <laughs> When the fired employees were male, participants assumed they felt less pain upon being fired. Um, they were marginally more likely to say they had been treated more fairly. Um, and when the managerial team fired male employees, participants assumed they had inflicted less harm on the male employees and perceived the team as more moral for firing the male employees. So what can we learn from this package of findings? Um, we more readily assume a female victim. We have a cognitive link between victim and female. We assume that women suffer more pain from their harm, which is congruent with this victim role. But yet, even when women fall in the perpetrator role, we can't help but carry along these associations of patiency and victimhood and still assume they, they suffer more pain. Men's suffering is perceived as more deserved and fair. People more readily typecast men as perpetrators and they feel more inclined to punish them and they would like to dole out harsher punishments to men. And these gender biases extend to group level harms. So even also in contexts where men generally suffer more. So there are data showing men show worse outcomes upon losing their job than do women. Yet even if we consider those cases where the real world discrepancies signal men have it worse, still then we have more pity for women and assume women are suffering more. So I think these carry a lot of important implications. It suggests it's gonna be more cognitively challenging for us to detect men's suffering because they don't align with our prototype of the victim. So we will less easily recognize and respond to men's victimization. And it suggests that public concern over gender inequalities are going to manifest asymmetrically because women more closely align with our prototype of the victim, whereas men align with our prototype of perpetrator. Such that we care a lot when women are disadvantaged at the top of society or show disparate outcomes, but relative apathy when men are disadvantaged at the bottom of society. And these, these patterns suggest that ills that disproportionately afflict men are going to be overlooked or perceived as deserved or fair or blamed on men themselves and likely not similarly addressed through policy or interventions. So I think the takeaway from these studies are that when men experience suffering, they're just told to man up and take it. So thank you. This research would not be what it is without all of my collaborators. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for a uh, very powerful, neat uh, experimental designs there, which put a lot of evidence behind what... Did you disaggregate the data based on the gender of the participants? Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. So we, we did, we looked at um, participant gender and we found this pattern such that women showed the bias more in general, other than the um, one study where we had um, Chinese managers, we found in that study only men showed the pattern, so not Chinese women, they didn't show the discrepancy. Um, so, so that might suggest that there are some cultural differences, perhaps on the gender pattern itself. Um, but we, we have also another set of studies looking at kind of the more, the broader consequences of this um, pattern. And we find again in those that women tend to show this bias um, more than do men. Um, yeah, thank you very much, by the way. So, as Martin said, there's a lot of stuff there that I think I've been thinking for a long time. Um, I guess what I wanted to just sort of reinforce and sort of bring out of that that I took is that we often I've, we hear that um, men need to speak up and seek help more. 
But what I'm taking from that is there's a cognitive bias that we're not listening. Right. And I've sat on safeguarding boards, Marek boards, I teach safeguarding. The amount of times I've sat in rooms and I've delivered training sessions where I've purposely hid the gender or given it away, then put it at the end. And people are literally, professionals who've been in um, psychology or, or drug and alcohol fields for 20 years will not accept the fact that it's all right, you just man up, mate. So to actually hear that was refreshing and just, yeah, a real tonic. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs>